It was mid-December, the sky was covered with some thick, dark clouds and there was a chill. No wind, just a chill, cold and still. The moment I see those clouds, my shoulders sink. It doesn't matter how I'm feeling before I see them. Even if I'm already in a dark mood, my shoulders always manage to sink a noticeable inch or two. My natural reaction to this weather is depression. I was particularly feeling down on that day. Something bad might have happened. Or I might have had a promotion at work. I can't tell. All I know is that the thick grey clouds were covering the entire sky and the beautiful sun that usually appears at midday in my cubicle was nowhere to be seen. I was on the 21st floor of a glass skyscraper that towered over the less significant buildings of the city. I started on the third floor. I still remember what I wore on my first day. It was a plain white shirt, two sizes too big, black pants that failed to express any fashion statement and what looked like a noose for a tie. Growing up, we used to call these clothes, thank you uncle. I never pictured myself wearing this at a job or anywhere else, but I had to look the part. My only inspiration for this abomination of style was, as you might have guessed it, my uncle. He was one of those cool uncles all the children loved. He was the youngest on my father's side and a delight to talk to. We took him from one of us, and to add to it, he was only half a head taller than me. So every time he parted with his old clothes, I was first in the short line of inheritance. Thank you, uncle, I would say. My wardrobe has improved over the years, but along the way, I have stopped caring about what I wear. I have been accused of being ungrateful when I receive new clothing as a gift. I have nothing against a new pair of shoes, mind you, especially when they fit so well and are lined for comfort. But what I find irritable is having to think about them. A shoe's purpose is to protect your feet and keep them ache-free throughout the day. But a shoe that forces me to be constantly vigilant for fear of getting them dirty is not something I want to wear. I would rather wear an old pair that I can accidentally walk in a puddle with and not worry too much. I came into the job market with the enthusiasm of a boy ready to change the world. I've graduated top in my field as a computer engineer. Companies fought to have me work for them in what turned out to be unpaid labor. I hopped from job to job, laboring and proving myself, until a huge company had decided to hire me for good. I stopped hopping. I came in from the third floor with a grin plastered on my face. I remember the first time I saw the designer. This company's logo was a blue silhouette with curvy hips inside a circle. It was referred to as the designer in the welcome kit. Our motto was we design the future. And yes, I was excited to be working at the edge of technology. Those were the good days. Every morning was like going to a friendly competition where the contestants hugged and shook hands in the end. I knew all my co-workers, we spent lunch time together, we met after work and we joked around in the workplace. You could have a conversation with anyone on the floor and everyone was always eager to join the talk. We made fun of those quiet faces that stood in the back of the elevator. I loved those days. Every achievement were celebrated with a free lunch where the whole team, including some of those faces without name, invaded a restaurant. We would laugh, drink, eat, toast like it was our last day on earth. Yet, these events were so frequent that I found myself expecting them every other week or so. This all changed when I was promoted to the 10th floor. It was like when you graduate from middle school and don't find your friend sitting next to you anymore. Now each class had a different teacher and next to you was a different unfriendly face. Oh, high school was so cruel. I still wonder how this crony child that I was had survived those years. Some of my classmates were kids with thick beards and large construction workers arms like they were part of the crew rebuilding the school's auditorium. I was the perfect candidate for bullying. I had to be vigilant. For the better part of the year, I pretended I was from the student exchange program, adding a thick paste of India on my accent, so they would think I did not understand their threats. 
it gave me a sort of diplomatic immunity and they quickly moved on to harass the next well-spoken kid. Tanweer always looked at me suspiciously. Anyway, work became like high school. Except here, the cruelty was your coworker trying to cheat you out of a promotion. The hardest was when some would pretend to be your friends just to stab you in the back. Among a thousand, I would remember this one. Not his name, but his face. The memory is still much vivid in my mind. He seemed so nice and eager to learn. He nodded so much at every instruction I gave that it sometimes looked like a bow. I would always end with a hand on his shoulder, like a friendly king, saying, Rise, worthy knight. But then, he would bow again, run to his desk, and follow my instructions to the T. I was happy to have found at least one person who wasn't playing at this game of deceit. But I was wrong. He played a particular game of deceit. What I didn't know is that he was not new at all. He was playing the part to take credit of my work. He gained access to my computer and every night he signed all my work with his own name. Every morning I would rename them back, thinking it was a bug in the software that overrode my name. Eventually I wrote a small script that would rename my work back to its original state every morning and never complain about it. When he came for a promotion, he became distant. When I passed him in the hallways, he would pretend not to see me or he would manipulate his phone with an urgent look on his face. I received that promotion. I walked to his desk with a box carrying my personal belongings and called his name. He hissed. Then he presented me with his clutch hand and this time he unbowed his middle finger. For each floor I climbed thereafter, there was a similar scenario, sometimes with two or three different actors. I felt gravity jealously holding me down. Technically the grip of gravity gets looser as you climb at a higher altitude. But what the physics books don't tell you is of that mental property you have to leave behind for every thrust ahead. By the time I reached the 21st floor, gravity had turned into shackles around my arms and ankles. My hair had started to turn white, my mental fuel was depleted, getting up from bed had become a challenge. I viewed work, and the building that surrounded it, as a soul-sucking void that was so close to draining the last ounces of life I had left. But this job was all I was good at. It was all I ever did. I spent more time sitting in that cubicle than I spent anywhere else in my day. I was exhausted from the fight that it was to climb another floor, yet it was all I knew. In the five years I spent there, I have climbed faster than anyone has ever done in the history of the company. At least that's what the grey-haired man told me during my last promotion. I always got promotions, but they made me sad. In doing my job right, I paid the price of leaving my close friends behind and made enemies. I will call them enemies because it was a fight to be in their presence. Defeating my enemies would have felt like a victory if only I couldn't see their sad faces after. On the 18th floor, I felt I had finally found something that would shatter my shackles and propel me in a life where I could be happy. I was happy for a moment. I had a romantic encounter. It was this girl. I'm having a hard time remembering her face, but oh, how beautiful she was. We always took the elevator to the same floor, but it was so packed that we always ended up being carried away by the stream of people in opposite directions. All I could do was share a glance before she disappeared on the east side of the building and I on the west. One day, I got a promotion, another floor up. The next day, I came to the office and found her standing by the elevator. It was just the two of us. Oh, how beautiful she had looked in her. And her... Memory. So unfaithful. But I remember the feeling of beauty. When the door opened, we entered and stood still, side by side, until it closed. She giggled. The elevator door was of a reflective gold, and I could see her... The lack of oxygen can play serious tricks on the mind. Oh, whatever. I could see her beautiful eyes shining away. She smiled a very pretty smile with her teeth shining like pearls through the reflections. Her hair bounced and gleamed like it was alive. She let go of her crossed arms and they came so close to mine. If only I was standing closer, 
I made a silent prayer for a scenario where our hands would brush slightly. Saint Otis of the Guild of Elevators answered my prayer by suddenly jerking the box, slightly swinging her my way, like a brother looking out for me. I let myself swing in the opposite direction and pushed some more until our hands brushed. She turned and her eyes met mine. Ah, that moment should have lasted forever. But it didn't. Instead, she swung away. Then her hand came back. Her finger slipped into mine. Ding! The elevator door opened. We stood still. I looked deep into her eyes. In that single look and our fingers tangle, I saw her entire story unfold before me. She was God's answer to a thousand-year-old prayer, perfection embodied in delicate hands, soft skin, beautiful lips and glaring eyes, a woman with the strength to stand by you for the good and the bad. Here I was, lucky to be standing in the right place, at the right time. She stepped out, her hand still in mine. I didn't move until she felt my grip. It was her stop, not mine. She turned back, looked at my hand, then my eyes. Her silk fingers slowly slipped away. The door started closing almost too quickly. I caught the last glimpse of her, trying to scream my name. Her last expression, a frown that turned into my own reflection as the door closed shut. Everyone always had the same expression when they were left behind. This was three floors ago. There were 50 floors in this building. What else would I lose before I get to the top?